The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald. And what is the nuance of an atheist anyways, and how do they celebrate Christmas? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is uh, Christmas has gotten so secular in this country, it's almost a non-issue now um, that it's got pagan roots. It's, I just say, as much as it bothers the Christians that they're stealing everything from the Yule celebration, it's about as much as we feel it's stealing from the Christian celebration, if you will. Hmm. Um, how much of it is um, like I, I can say for me, I, um, I I remember this defining moment. I mean, I I was um, you know put into the, the the Christian swell of 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 Christmas Yuletide spirit, and I yeah. loved it. It was great. Yeah, and it is um, great. Yeah, you know, probably a lot like the belief system, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the funny thing is, I mean, we've been celebrating this time of year, the winter solstice, for since the late Stone Age, basically. And so it's it's certainly older than Christianity. And yet, ironically, most of what we celebrate uh, Christian Christmas as, a lot of it didn't come from those traditions. It came from Victorian traditions that were invented after Charles Dickens' book came out, you know. Oh, um, yeah. So there's a very funny dichotomy about the way we celebrate Christmas. But you're 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 also assuming that we're trying to you know prep uh, perpetuate uh, you know some sort of like uh, cultural lineage or some sort of non contradictory sort of thing. And I'm wondering, eh, I don't know. It's like you say, no, Christmas is about the you know the the Coke polar bear, and it's about the <laughs> excessive gift giving. Let's just own it. That's what we like yeah. to do. I mean, what do yeah. kids like in Christmas morning? They like all the presents, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes you got to hit the argument where it's coming from. And it's <laughs> like, it's it's just like people want to get shit and it feels good to open presents. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It, it, there's all kinds of reasons to love Christmas. David's talking about how. Christians like to complain about how we've strayed from the original meaning of Christmas. Right. But in fact, if you look at Matthew and Luke, they're two totally <laughs> different stories. And Matthew, Jesus is, is super Moses. And in Luke, they're trying to trace him back. So they have to they want to place him in Bethlehem. They're trying to trace him back. Exactly. To the and they invent they, they, two totally fake scenarios to accomplish this. Totally, totally fake scenarios. One, two totally different tones. One super scary, one super happy, joy, joy. And yet we've managed to match them both together and do our Christmas pageants every year and uh, blending these two completely contradictory stories. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because I kind of want to talk about before Christmas, before Christmas, before Christmas, because um, as far as back as the late Stone Age, apparently, people have been celebrating the time of the winter solstice and that midwinter period when they re finally realized that yeah, the winter's not just going to keep getting longer and longer and longer. It's going to make the turnaround and the sun's going to come back. And uh, during the Neolithic time, this was when you could take a break from the grueling uh, bit of chores that you had uh, that took up most of people's time. You were able to slaughter the animals so you wouldn't have to feed them during the winter. And so you have a surplus of meat for the first time. And all the wine and the beer that you've been uh fermenting all this time through the, the harvest, now is ready to drink. And so the celebration of this midwinter time goes back really, really far. And there's more than one celebration involved in it, and including some very scary ones like Halloween. So Halloween, the Thanksgiving festival, the harvest festival, uh, Christmas and New Year's, this whole period goes back way before Christianity. Um, and not just, not just in Europe, but all through the Middle East and Asia as well. Um, but let's jump into our Christmas story because Christians don't care about all those pagan things that happened before Christian uh, Christmas. And they don't care about all the different other civilizations and cultures that had their own midwinter festival because to them, Christian Christmas is all about Jesus. So let's just jump real fast into the first Christmas story. And by that, I mean the first two Christmas stories. Matthews and Luke's. Unfortunately, they're not the same story. So here's Matthew's story. We've got Joseph. He's a descendant of David. He hasn't yet slept with his betrothed wife, Mary, 
but she's pregnant. Uh oh. And so not willing to publicly embarrass Mary, he plans to quietly divorce her. Well, while he's thinking about these things, an angel appears to him in a dream and tells him, don't be afraid of taking her as wife because she's been impregnated by the Holy Spirit and will give birth to a son who are they, they are to name Jesus. And strangely enough, this is said to fulfill the prophecy and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Joseph awakes and he does as the angel says, and he takes Mary home with him, but he does not have sex with her until the son is born. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Judea, during Herod's reign. And that is, in fact, the only details we get of Jesus' birth from Matthew. After he's born, Zoroastrian astrologers from Persia, the wise men from the east, come to Jerusalem to ask where the newborn king of the Jews is, since they've seen his star in the east and they've come to worship him. Well, when King Herod hears this, he's troubled, along with all of Jerusalem, and he gathers together the chief priests and scribes together, and demands to know where Jesus is supposed to have been born. They tell him that the Christ will appear in Bethlehem. So he secretly meets with the wise men to find out where the star appeared and sends him to Bethlehem, telling him to go find this young child and send word so that he can come and worship him too. So the wise men depart, and the star that they saw in the east miraculously reappears and goes before them until it comes to a stop exactly over Jesus' house in Bethlehem. So rejoicing greatly, they come to the house and find the young child with his mother and fall down and worship him. And they present him with royal gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they're warned by an angel in a dream of theirs that they should not return to, uh, to Herod. So instead, they go home to Persia by another route. Now, when the wise men leave, another angel appears to Joseph in yet another dream, telling him to take the family and flee to Egypt and stay there until further noticed, because Herod is after them. So they leave by night for Egypt. When Herod finds out he's been tricked by the Christ child and by the wise men, he's furious, and he realizes that the wise men aren't coming back. So he sends his troop throughout Bethlehem and its environs to kill all the baby boys two years and under. Incidentally, that's how we know this is happening about two years after Jesus is meant to have been born, not the night of. Um, after Herod's death in 4 BC, another angel appears in yet another dream to Joseph in Egypt and tells him it's safe to come back to Israel. So when Joseph hears that Herod's son Archelaus is now on the throne, he's frightened to go to Judea. But yet another angel appears to him in yet another dream, and he takes the family up into the Galilee instead and makes a city called Nazareth their new home. Apparently, the angel didn't know that at this time, the Galilee was under control of one of Herod's other sons. But let's leave that for now. That's Matthew's story. Here's Luke's story. So in Luke's story, the angel Gabriel appears in Nazareth to Mary, a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph. And he tells her that even though she's a virgin, she's going to bear a son named Jesus, and that he will be great, and she'll be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there'll be no end. And he also informs her that her barren cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Well, Mary quickly leaves to the hill country, to a city in Judah, where her cousin Elizabeth lives. And at this, baby John the Baptist leaps in her womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary stays with her about three months and returns to her own house, and Elizabeth gives birth to John the Baptist. Now, about this time, Caesar Augustus decrees a tax, and Luke tells us this happens when Quirinius is governor of Syria, which would make it 6 to 7 CE AD, if you will. So Joseph leaves his house at Nazareth and goes to Bethlehem to be taxed, taking along his very pregnant wife, Mary. Now, because there's no room for them in the inn, Mary gives birth and lays him in a manger. An angel appears to shepherds in the countryside, along with a multitude of the heavenly host, and announces the birth of their Savior, Christ the Lord. And the shepherds go and find Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, and they start telling everyone what the angel told them, making it widely known to the marveling populace, and Mary ponders these things in her heart. Eight days later, baby Jesus is circumcised and named, and after Mary's ritual 40-day purification period ends, they sacrifice a pair of turtle doves, pigeons, in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and there a devout holy man, Simeon, blesses Jesus, saying that he can die happy now that he's seen the Lord's Christ. And Jesus, Joseph and Mary marvel at this. Anna, an elderly widow and prophetess, 
also give thanks and begins telling everyone about Jesus. And Mary, Joseph, and Jesus return home to Nazareth. And young Jesus grows up in Nazareth, strong in spirit, filled with the wisdom and grace of God. And every year his parents go to Jerusalem for Passover. And he increases in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, quick recap. Matthew's story reads like a dramatic chase story. The real action doesn't even begin until years after Jesus is actually born. Um, and in fact, he doesn't even spend an entire sentence on the actual birth of Jesus. Just those Wait, five okay. words, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. David, can you turn your camera off and on? You, you, you've been frozen for a while. Oh, no. <laughs> Where should I go back? Uh, he's okay with me. Oh, you, you see him moving? Yeah, he's moving right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, where was I? Okay. So Matthew doesn't even spend an entire sentence on the actual birth of Jesus. Just five words. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then the story gets in high gear with all these dark happenings. Mysterious wise men from the east. Moving star intrigue. The evil king's plot. Late night escape into Egypt. A horrific massacre, the Holy Family sneaking from place to place on the run, and angels appearing in dreams. Lots of angels appearing to lots of people in lots of dreams. Um, Matthew either seems to have a lot of first-hand knowledge of what was going on in people's dreams, or a very limited imagination when it comes to plot devices. Now, by contrast, Luke's story is all sunshine and light full of cheerful details about Jesus' wonderful birth and childhood. And it's really two stories, as he intermingles the story of John the Baptist in the first part of his book with the nativity story of Jesus. But both are angst-free, happy tales of good things happening to happy people. Um, in Matthew, anonymous angels repeatedly appear in dreams to the menfolk, Joseph mostly. But in Luke, the angel Gabriel shows up in waking life to the women, one appearance to each. And unlike Matthew, who puts Jesus immediately on the run to Egypt to save his life, in Luke, everyone is delighted with the Savior's birth, including the prophets, who acclaim him before everyone in the temple. And while Matthew has J Joseph finally arrive in Nazareth for the first time at the very end of his story, in Luke, Matthew and Joseph not only both start out in Nazareth, but they go back and forth from Nazareth to Jerusalem for Passover every year during the same time when Matthew has them hiding out in Egypt. And yet, somehow... Christians have managed to ma mash both these stories into the story that we know as Christmas today. Yeah. What, what I find really interesting about what your approach is on this, David, is that is the two parallel stories. Um, and, um, you know, because remind me um, of, of your position on, on something. I mean, you're, you're a mythicist, but um, was there any, there, there's, there's, um, your position is that the man never existed, period, and, and complete right. full end stop, right? Though, to be fair, if you yeah. have no truck with mythicism, people, you know, atheists, don't have any problem accepting that if there was a real Jesus, these stories about his nativity are myths. So, if that's, that's not controversial. Yeah, uh, and that's the interesting thing that I'm hoping that we can convey to the audience is that because anytime I, um, I, I get in the mind, spe uh, the mind space of trying to understand, you know, talk about religion and talk yeah. about religion, yeah. I have to really keep these different narratives running at different levels, right? Because, you know, I, I'm in a, a similar position to you, okay, uh -huh. that the, the man never existed. Scott does think he existed, but again, he, but whether, whether by he your... or not, we can all agree that these particular stories about him yeah. For a variety of reasons, not least of all that they don't match up at the least little bit. Yeah. They both can't be true. Yeah. It's easy to to think of this as being just some of that legendary creation that happened after the fact, long after the fact. Yeah. And even, so, even Catholics recognize that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and, I mean, and it, in fact, we could talk more about the logical problems with each of the stories individually, too. Um, not just things like stars hovering over houses, but just the 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 historical dating that they give like this was during Herod's time well this was during Corinthians's time those are that's a gap of at least 10 years right there for starters um and there are other problems like for instance them not knowing that their plot devices don't work because at the time they're describing either Galilee wasn't part of the Roman Empire or Judea wasn't you know there's just there's just things that uh don't make sense um that somebody who was writing around the end of the first century when these were written or the early second century for that matter 
wasn't as obvious that they were making huge mistakes in their story. And like Ehrman says, if there really was a census and you had to go back to where your ancestors lived a thousand years before, no one would know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's yeah, it's crazy. And and you wouldn't take your pregnant wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do it either. Do you, hey, yeah. do you guys know that Ehrman's got an uh, uh, an event on Saturday? It's like fifty bucks or something, or eighty uh, bucks to go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I think it's going to be an awesome event. Actually, I think he'll do a great job. Um, okay. Yeah, I probably, I, pay, I, I probably won't pay fifty bucks to see it myself, but I have no doubt it, it's going to be excellent. Scott, did you hear about it? Yeah, yeah, I'm on his mailing list. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> I thought you know, I thought that I thought that was pretty good. So, I again, I wanted to to pull through this the thesis of. That 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 Jesus did not exist, or he was a, a myth, a partial myth. Whether yeah. he was, even if he, you know, it's like that ice uh, iceberg scenario. Okay, so fine, he existed, but all the myth makes him so much more the man, the imagined <laughs> embodiment of what humanity is, could be, yeah. and represents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I think what's what's wrong with hammering that home, right? I mean, I look at it from a secular standpoint, and I say. It's pretend, right. but I can't say it. I can't say the word pretend without sounding like I'm insulting your intelligence. Right. And but, I, I was going to say, for as much as people like to bag on Joseph Campbell and his power of yeah. myth thing, um, yeah. I think it's it's really important when we recognize these stories as myth. Like we don't worry about if Shakespeare was true. We don't worry about Winnie the Pooh or Aesop's fables, but we learn amazing things from them and valuable things from them, just like we do from movies, like, you know, Marvel movies, Superman movies, you know, The Matrix. We, we've got all of these historical, not historical, but cultural touchstones that come to us through the stories we tell. And I love that. And I love the biblical stories for that matter, too. But when we we don't have people blowing up abortion clinics in the name of Aesop or flying planes in the name of, you know, Winnie the Pooh. Um, yeah. That's where we draw the line. It's like there's there's the truth in myth and there's the truth in history. And as long as we don't confuse the two, I think we can get a lot of richness out of that. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I'll give you a for instance. Um, the story of that Mark tells, our first gospel writer, his original Jesus is much different than Matthew or Luke's or John's for that matter, much different from John's. Um, and when you read the story the way that Mark wrote it as the story of a guy, a human being just like us, who because he was uh, obedient to God, God adopts him as his son at his baptism, immediately sends him off to the desert to, for his job training to get tested. Um, and then he goes through this um, career and winds up in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that he's about to be asked to be killed horribly. And that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, when you realize this is not a God slumming on earth for a few years, this is a normal man, just like us, who knows what God wants him to do and is terrified and says, but if you want me to do it, God, I will. That's so, there's so much pathos in that, reading it that way. Um, and because he does go through the whole horrible, becomes a scapegoat for the sins of Israel and the sins of the whole world, God raises him on high and exalts him uh, the third day. And he becomes the son of God and joins him in heaven. When you read John's gospel, you don't get any of that because he, he might as well have I am God written all over his shirt. And he doesn't even die in the same way. He dies to prove that he's God. Mm -hmm. um, and just reading each of the Gospels, the way the take they do on things, it's very and sometimes the take is very different. Uh, and sometimes it's very subtle. I mean, obvious and sometimes it's very subtle. Like, for instance, some of the Gospels, uh, Satan goes into Judas's heart and makes him betray uh, Jesus. In other Gospels, Satan is trying to talk him out of, uh, of saving the, the, the everyone, you know, and he says, get behind me, Satan. I know what I got to do. Um, and it's, it's just very interesting to see the ways that the, the four Gospels and all the other Gospels that didn't make the cut view how this story came about, this salvation. 
Is payment for sin in Mark? Yeah, yeah, it's in all of them, in all of them. But there's, it's slightly different Christology in each of them. Um, and what I mean by that is Mark's, the first gospel, he's a very human, fallible figure um, who keeps telling people, okay, let's keep it under your wrap. Don't tell anyone where I touched you. Don't get, show her my miracles. And that's why no one knows the story today, according to Mark, is because the silly women ran from the tomb and didn't tell anyone. That's how his gospel originally ended. Um, but he, Jesus gets bigger and stronger and more self-assured as the gospels progress. Um, Matthew was probably the next one written, and he spends a lot of time correcting Mark's mistakes. He makes a lot of basic mistakes about Judaism and about Palestinian geography. Um, and he makes more obvious what Mark does. Mark continually, continuously makes allusions to the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures and to other sources. And he expects his readers to either recognize what he's doing or be so charmed by the story that they don't worry about that. Uh, but he expects the the, 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 the the more literate ones who are like him, uh, educated but with a Greek education and know how these things work, that he's actually talking about a higher plane of things. Um, and there's a couple of verses where, for instance, when he feeds the loaves and fishes, he says, yeah, seven loaves and 12 fishes, or vice versa. He says, get it? Seven, 12? And, uh, and there's these winks to the audience. Um, there's a great verse at the very beginning of Mark's gospel in 411, where he's talking to his, uh, his inner circle, his disciples. And forgive me if I've told this story before, but he says, um, now I'm going to teach you in parables, but I'll tell you what they really mean. But to those outside, they'll just have a good story. Otherwise, they would turn from their sins and be saved. It's like, that makes no sense for our typical uh, Jesus that we think of in here in 20th century America makes perfect sense if this was a uh, a version of the mystery face where you have to be in on it uh, to know the whole story. There's an in-group uh, factor there that at its roots is really part of how a cult congeals. Absolutely. And it's explicitly so. It's explicitly yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking. Do you have any any thoughts on why Matthew doubles the incidents from Mark? What was the doubling about? Yeah, what what Scott's talking about is like in a lot of cases, Mark will have a parable about say a, a blind man, and Matthew will have the two, the same one, and it'll be two blind men, you know. Or or the best the classic example is that Matthew has Jesus riding in on an ass and its foal, and. Uh, um, and it's like, is he supposed to be rodeo circus riding or something like this? He's on two donkeys, you know, and they think what's happening is, well, with the, the, that particular case, they think it's a, uh, example of a ass, a foal of a donkey, either talking about the same thing, a one single creature. But in other cases, that's not the case because he's obviously doubling up, um, people. And one theory about that is that he has two different uh, verses in mind that he's drawing on. And so he wants to include both um, that they're taking things from the old Testament primarily. That's what they're taking it from the old Testament. There's some other uh, uh, sources that may have been in the mix too, at least for Mark. Um, but he wants to include everything. Uh, Luke does something similar, not with the doubling, but he likes to include celebrity appearances. So he there's a, all these first century celebrities uh, that make their way into Luke's uh, gospel. And he also wants to be a big tent Christianity. So he has Pharisees coming in. He has Gamaliel. Um, he's got the Jews. He's got uh, John the Baptist. Uh, in fact, I talked about how he got John the Baptist. His birth story is in uh, the first two chapters of Luke. It's actually longer than Luke's story of Jesus' birth. And it looks very obviously that it was taken from John the Baptist's scriptures when John the Baptist cult had a, a living scripture that uh, was surviving at that time, does not survive today. But 
when you remove the traces that he's inserted Jesus into the story, suddenly it makes a lot more sense because there's not that many to, to, uh, to mess around with. But one that really sticks out is Mary's cousin, cousin Elizabeth is supposed to be an, a woman too old to have a baby. She's barren. And yet through the miracle of God, she has a baby. And there's a song that Mary sings about it. Well, the song is based on an Old Testament story in Samuel. Um, when Samuel's mother, an old woman who's too old to conceive, miraculously conceives, she sings a song thanking God because I'm an old woman and yet you opened my womb and blah, 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 blah. That song in, in Luke, Mary sings. But mm. that song doesn't apply to Mary. It applies to Elizabeth. Um, and other things like that make it really obvious that he's just shoehorning Jesus and Mary into a John the Baptist story, uh, which, again, is much longer in Luke than Jesus' story is. Yeah, just to make it sound like there's a lot of ad hoc connections is is actually, I don't know. I think it's fairly pervasive in so many of the of 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 uh, how this congeals in in scripture yeah. and text, yeah. right? And so I was thinking as I was I was kind of running around a few ideas about the Christmas story, and I was thinking about the Annunciation, right? This announcement, yeah. and um, it 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 occurred to me. I I was trying to think of a couple groups, so a pagan group, and you're trying to convince a pagan group. I mean, just, I know it's not really how it would work. I mean, it would work on more of a network scale, but it's, I mean, imagine going to a group of pagans and saying, look, guys, this is actually the existence of God, right? This is how it is, and, you know, this is introducing Jesus and all this kind of thing, right? And they're like, they're dude, like, heard this story before. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it's just, we know, like, the sunsets, it's the point is it's the solstice. You can't yeah. tell me there's nothing anything more real than that. I mean, it's not right. something like this, right? Right. But that's the thing. And then they're saying, but you know what? It's before that solstice, just as as sure as a mother's womb and a baby's born, right? Nine months before, <laughs> that's when that announcement was. That's when the pagan thing began. We were before the pagan thing, right? And, and then they're not, like huh, maybe he's right, you know? And there were early church fathers who actually made that argument that like, hey, look, we're not saying anything different than what you're saying about, you know, the sons of Zeus or something yeah. like that. And others went as far as to make this incredible uh, argument that, oh yeah, all those other pagan religions that ha happened hundreds of years before, well, that's obvious that the devil read the scriptures and the prophecies and figured out what Christianity would look like because, you know, the prophecies are so dead on, you know, and created his own counterfeit Christianities in advance of the real Christianity. It's like, yeah, you know, God can be a big deadbeat dad, but hey, that's Satan. It's just Johnny on the spot 24 seven. He's the look, hardest look, man in show business. Scripture and transcendence has fallen yeah. from the heavens. And I'll explain why I make that point. <laughs> The, the the idea we, we we see this with scripture it's it's made its way down to the plebeian right that's mm -hmm. why there is a vulgate and so mm. what happens when it starts to spread out amongst you know more of the mass population well there's more complexity down there yeah and and i was looking i, I was thinking of two words i thought of um redemption and renewal and christianity mm. does that uniquely mm. right they're the universal concept of renewal and rebirth Right. I mean, metaphysically I, and metaphorically. No, I, I, no? I would I would kind of raise an eyebrow saying that Christianity is the source for all that, because we were getting that in other religions as well. And I'm sure um, if I think about it, other current religions would say the same thing as well. Isn't that what I said? Christianity was. Oh, I know that, that, that I don't think that Christianity is the sole proprietor of such ideas. OK, OK, yeah. OK. Well, um, I think I think they tried to it was the unification theory with the mm, level on mm. the ground and the transcendent towards the upward. I mean, mm. I, you know, I don't know if you've read much Nietzsche, but the idea that the that Socrates was the usher in of decadence is really what, mm. you know, so you think of this uh, religion of the Jews um, as one of decadence. And it's just odd because, you know, early on in your description, you're saying about, um, uh, you know, how the how the kings came to, you know, worship Jesus and the birth and all this sort of yeah. thing. So you imagine that the congeal of that story did not happen in real time. But imagine the community of the Jewish 
uh, communities going, what? I mean, you know, like, come on. Okay. They're like, <laughs> Okay, we speak in metaphor, right? We get this. Uh, yeah. I understand how it's the son of God. I get that. Okay, we'll give him that. Okay, we kill, <laughs> we kill like we force it. Oh man, you know, like, and and then they're gonna talk about it, and it, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's like they can argue it, but it's kind of on their own turf. You know what I mean? Like it's well, yeah, and because everything that Mark brings to uh, and the Gospels bring to the table, most of it ultimately it comes from Midrash from the Hebrew scriptures. So there's, I mean, it's very much a co-opting element. Uh, and you just talking about the wise men, for instance, it, uh, there's an argument can be made that the wise men are actually taken from a motif in Daniel. Um, and we could probably break down every single aspect in both Matthew's story and Luke's story to see where they're getting this or that particular aspect of it. Um, and, David, I have a side question for you. Yeah. Where would you say, um, like, you must notice people come over to your um, side, so to speak, right? Like, mm. um, you know, you, you start off having a friendship with somebody and then slowly over time, they kind of, you know, head on over. You've been around long enough for, you know, for that to actually happen. What is it? What is it like? Do you recall a few um relationships with people where they've you know started to see through through your eyes um that has happened uh quite a bit actually over the years and um i used to uh when i lived in san francisco there would be like student groups from um christian schools that would come up to the bay area to have their kids talk to to atheists basically to do counter apologetics and i i think it's fantastic and i i said you know what I love that you're doing that. You're putting your money where your mouth is. You're having the kids face it. And uh, I, for 14 years or so while I lived there, I was doing that and had a blast. But I would get letters from kids every now and again saying, hey, thanks, I'm an atheist now. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. I have a, a talk that I do on sex and violence in the Bible. And I had a friend tell me um, <laughs> that, Dave, I had three Christian friends or I had two Christian friends in the uh, sitting next to me during the talk. And the whole time they were like this. And then she said, I got an email from her three days later saying, um, they've been locked up in their, their hotel room this whole time. And the next message I've got was they've left their church. <laughs> oh, wow. That's yeah. Uh, that's, it it, it, it kind of warms my heart. And, uh, <laughs> you know, part, part of what I love about, the why I'm still into biblical study is because I love that feeling when you some piece of the puzzle that didn't make sense before suddenly you realize where it came from, or at least a possibility. We don't always know with hundred percent certainty, but when suddenly something that made no sense suddenly makes sense. Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. And I think that's that fact that the truth is such a great flirt, you know, when, um, when 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 suddenly things make sense it's that's when i love being an atheist it's yeah. it's you really see and that's why i love it's not enough for me to just say eh, i'm done with christianity it's done i probably i eh, probably i definitely read the bible more as an atheist than i ever did as a christian and i get so much more out of it yeah. um and it's it's not just what they meant for it to come across but when you see the mistakes they made and the why they made them and not the mistakes but when they actually make deliberate changes um and when bible books uh contradict each other when they <laughs> oppose each other i just that blows my mind i love that uh, so, and you realize it's it's a very human creation it's a very collaborative creation and you see how many different influences went into what we call christianity or any other religion for that matter or any other religion yeah so when you see changes, um, I mean, contradictions, I get that because these could be errors. But when you see. Well, yeah. And I don't mean I don't just mean contradictions. I mean, where one uh, book uh, like like a history book, for instance, the Deuteronomy history and the Chronicler, when they say the exact opposite thing, uh, yeah. you know, and where you where they're coming from a complete opposite, say, where, you know, this king of Judah was awesome. Oh, no, this king of Judah was bad, you know, or this. Um, it, it's it's really it's fun to watch that 
and just see the the human humanity behind the Bible. Well, what I meant is that have you witnessed or seen even in a translation anything that would, um, uh, I guess, warm your heart? Okay, let's say that about how editors are approaching things. I mean, there's one contradict. There's one. Um, I guess, uh, move that an atheist will make about the horrors of religion and all these kinds of things. And I, yeah. I, I get, I get that. But, um, do you think from re spending so much time with these texts that, that, that the changes that the state or the clergy actually make are, um, uh, the best intent or malicious or what, what is your cool. overall it, feeling? You know, it's funny because I do a lot of thought about the evolution of religion and not just Christianity, but all of them basically um and no matter what we're talking about like stone age shaman or chieftains or city states in mesopotamia you've got that constant tension between is this something that's there because it unites the people and gives them a benefit or is it there to make the ruling class have higher control over the people and there's no real answer because it's both all the time. All the successful religions seem to operate in the same evolutionary structures and they go through the same stages. The theology always changes. The gods are always different. The rules are always different, but the structures of the religions are very, very much of a sort. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about South America, Siberia, uh, Europe, Mesopotamia, uh, the Polynesia, they all go through these kind of stages. Um, and uh, I've done an article with uh, Valet Terrico um, that uh, part two is going to be talking about that very thing. Um, Could you outline that structure? Yeah, basically, um, there's, if there's things that we get f when we were pre-human, when we were primates, when we were social animals that lend itself to uh, religious thinking, even before we thought, even before we had language, things like um, an overactive agency detector. And what I mean by that is uh, the theory that if when in doubt, assume when in predator. doubt, assume there's something out there. Yeah. yeah, and it's why we see faces in clouds. It's because um, it's more it's safer to be wrong about a tiger that's not there than it is to be wrong about a tiger that is there. And so evolution tends to give us more active imagination about that. Um, just the same things that make us social animals also can contribute to that. When we get into language and prehistory, um, first the first stage of religion, and we see this, and when I talk about the, the, like the prehistoric stages and the early stages, we are usually getting this from anthropologists and sociologists who study like um, hunter-gatherer societies and, you know, native ones. And this not necessarily current, but even in the 19th century, 18th century, um, we would study the way they looked at religion. Um, and the early stages, there is no religion. There's no priest class. There's no, everyone, it's like the Dothraki in Game of Thrones. It is known that the sun is a big ball over here. It is known that, you know, animals there. And Animals and people and weather and gods and stars and moons and stuff, they're all kind of all part of the same picture. Sometimes there's a god who's over it all, and sometimes there's not, you know. But they have all these stages, and there's no religious ritual. There's no good or bad moral karma keeping. Um, the gods are people you have to deal with just like anybody else, and sometimes they're dicks, sometimes they're great, just like everybody else. Um and uh, I'm giving you a very, very bare bones about this that we could talk a lot about it, and I will talk about more in that article. Give a, a rom of embarrassing, ugly mythology at the beginning, and then over time, they get, this gets debugged and rationalized and ethicized, and then you have something that begins to make sense, like that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's funny. You, at first, it's very loosey-goosey, and there's no morals. It's not that kind of system. It's just that's the way the world is. They're just trying to make sense of the world around them. Then... Eventually, you develop a specialist, a the stock market executive and analysis of the ancient world, the shaman. And the shaman is the guy who can go back and forth between these gods and spirits and whatnot, uh, these supernatural elements, and make deals for you or cure, cure you when you're sick and things like that. 
that quickly leads to a chieftain. And when you have a chieftain and a shaman, you pretty much got a, a little, all the ingredients for a theocracy right there. Um, and there's lots of examples we can give of that, these kind of structures. Then when you get agriculture, uh, then you've got a city state, then you need, like for instance, you need uh, bookkeeping, you need literacy, you need all these structures to keep that afloat. And that's perfectly set up to be a religion. Um, and that's where you get full blown religions, gods, prophets, uh, lawgivers, and stuff like that. Um, goes from that to the bigger it gets, you start getting empires, you start getting different cultures where it's uh, either uh, this god and this god now become part of the same pantheon, or they get synchronized and become the same god. Um, you get uh, uh, different peoples in your inner circle. Your inner circle has gotten so big that it includes people who previously were the enemy. Now we're friends. If Once you can do business with them, all of a sudden all those verses about smiting become verses about, oh, you know, universal brotherhood. And they downplay the smiting and they upplay the universal brotherhood. And the, the emphasis on those switches back and forth through time, depending on how well you're getting along with your neighbors. And, and uh, it's always been Oceania we've been at war with. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, a lot of these stages were in uh, Robert Wright's book, The Evolution of God. And it dovetailed so nicely with a lot of the things I've been thinking about the evolution of religion and things like uh, people like Daniel Dennett and uh, David Sloan Wilson were saying about prehistoric religion and, and ongoing uh, that I'm trying to synchronize those all into uh, one big uh, working theory. Um, I was a young when I was young and there's someone who has this comforting story of recapitulation. I guess it's, it's mythology recapitulates early childhood development. Yeah. So I think it was Herbert Spencer. So infants want something, they just demand it verbally and the parent brings them. That's so that's the magical phase in, yeah. in cultural history. But then when the when the child when the infant becomes a toddler and the parent begins to expect some type of, of cooperation, then the economic, <laughs> religious, theocratic thing kicks in. And now you have to do a favor for the God in order yeah. for the God to do something for you. And that's and that's the, the religious phase. So, so there's yeah. a magical phase where you say, wow. God, give me some oatmeal. And then yeah. there's the other phrase like, God, I'll clean my room if you give me some oatmeal. And that, and that's what religion is. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then what's the next natural phase of natural growth would be uh, uh, senescence or what? convalescence. <laughs> or, I mean, you know, we do with people in ail ailing pop populations. Is that, do we even have a decision-making class there? That's Well, hopefully, hopefully uh, the next stage after what we see now is where that circle of the of universal brotherhood and all, uh, to, for lack of a better term, um, encompasses everybody, and you've got this little Gandhi level, you know, right? Yeah, enlightenment, maturity, and like, right. and like a peer. We're, we're peers with the other people. We're peers, and 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 hopefully everybody gets in on that, and we're all Unitarians and Universalists by that point. Um, that's that's the uh the optimal another optimal is that we realize that these are just religions these are just things we've made up for ourselves um and then you everybody becomes atheist and life is wonderful because you know atheists get along like a house on fire as, as we all know <laughs> yeah I, I wonder if you really do have these these early primate drives for things. I mean, what are we going to do with our generalized anxiety? Are we, going to, are we going to drug it to death so we can be good, good, boring, anti-mythological, everything's atoms in the void? I mean, that's a crock of crap, too. That's not even tolerable. I much prefer, <laughs> I prefer Carlos Castaneda over all all this molecule stuff. I mean, come on. I, I, I want to, in fact, I prefer like Hammer horror movies and Amicus British horror movies. I, I, I think things are, are sexy and perverse behind this thing. Like Blake. Blake thought things were just bizarre and interesting right around the corner, right? So that's that's why I've always been I've always preferred the occult picture of reality, which is that that at, at bottom Cthulhu is a personal deity, uh, uh, versus that, that that is just vacuum and atoms, and this is just random per permutations of nothing. You know, it's a funny thing about the whole atheist stereotype of I believe in nothing. You know, I'm a nihilist. You know, is when I became an atheist. I actually became so much more Christ-like than I ever was as a Christian. Um, 
because suddenly I stopped looking at people. Were they the right kind of Christian, i.e. Southern Baptist, no Californian style? Um, or were they anything else on the spectrum? And I was just like the Terminator going, save, not save, save, not save. And I was such a judgmental little prick. Um, and the and just realizing it, whoo, I don't believe that anymore. All of a sudden, everybody around me was human. It's like every around me belongs here. We're all human. And that was the whole point of the religion. That was the whole point of like, Jesus. <laughs> this is, we're not just slumming on earth. This is where we came from. This is where we belong. And we're part of this amazing, vast universe. Um, this beautiful, terrible, horrible, fantastic universe. Um, and I know I, I get great comfort out of that for some reason. Um, I don't remember if I was a afraid of dying when I was a Christian because I think I was pretty sure I would be going to heaven but I'm certainly not afraid of death now that I know I'd just be going back to where I came from before I was born you know um, it's just it's just funny the things you lose when you realize that Christianity you know love it or hate it is just a myth just one more myth that people have been making up and there's good things you can get out of it. And there's a lot of bad things. One of my favorite quotes, uh, I think it was a German theologian says, religion tends to make good people better and bad people worse. And I could not agree more. Could not agree more. Yeah. And incidentally, if there's any Christians listening to this, if your Christianity makes you a better person, makes you more empathetic, makes you more Christ-like, uh, makes you welcome the stranger, you know, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. And I have to point out, I mean, kudos to you, David, you said Christ-like, and that, and I think that's, you know, coming from a mythicist, it's saying, hey, he's a, an excellent role model. By definition, he was meant to be the ideal embodiment of, of, of a human being. And, yeah. uh, and it's funny, you know, I know what I mean when I say Christ-like, but there's so many Christs out there. <laughs> there's so, right. There's the angry Aryan Christ, there's the homophobic Christ, there's the kids be free hippie Christ, you know. Um, it's almost as if everybody has their own Christ, you know. Hey, it's a system that's consistently um, where the where the where the the ethics are, you know, context dependent. What's wrong with that? Bingo, <laughs> bingo, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You, you shall well, in the college, I got hold of the uh, the church letterhead, and I wrote letters to the Aggressive <laughs> Christian Mission Training Corps and the Jack <laughs> Chick. And I have I have two boxes of the most awesome, bizarre Christianity stuff. It's a treasure. I'm so we glad have to do that. a show just on that because letters to Jack <laughs> Chick alone. Uh, ah, I would. I was such a fan of Jack. I'm still a fan of Jack Chick. I love Jack Chick because he's so freaky deaky out there. Quick plug: Have you guys ever seen a YouTube video for a movie called Dark Dungeons? It's a movie takeoff on a Jack T. Chick trip uh track rather is, is it anti dungeons and dragons it well it's it's it pulls the lid on what dungeons and dragons is really about it's, it's i love that i had a library do you remember um pastor gary greenwald at trinity <laughs> broadcasting network he had a <laughs> shitty show he had a show called eagle's nest and one day he opened up with dry ice and a gate and he was in a cave <laughs> and he was he was reading like a, a an average dungeons and dragons encounter script and then he says friends what I've told you is not the latest X-rated novel slash horror movie. This is something your children are doing by themselves. They're role-playing themselves as suck you by, bum, bum, as bum, ink bum. you by, as yes. demons. And in this game, for example, you could kill somebody and not be arrested for it. In bum, this game, you use three six-sided dice to roll your oh. character. Six, six, six. Oh. Oh, I love that stuff. And that and backward masking, those are those oh, yes. when I was a little kid. Yes, yeah. Oh, I remember. Yeah, that demon did because there's that genius kid who played uh, D and D and got killed in the sub in the uh, subway of his as a uh, that never his, happened. That whole thing never yeah, happened. Yeah. The story that they, that they based Maze of the Monsters on the yes. journalist made that whole thing up. The yes. whole thing was nothing. Yeah, yeah. And yet, that yeah, the whole satanic panic of the '80s fed right into that, which is was ironic because one of the major influences on Dungeons and Dragons was C.S. Lewis and <laughs> J.R. Tolkien. You know. Uh, <laughs> And it's like, yeah, those are the bad guys that the good guys fight, you know. But anyway, anyway, don't get me started. Uh, it's just like it's just like Harry Potter. 
is like when the last movie came out, it could not be a better analogy for Jesus, you know, King's Crossing and stuff like that. And so, yeah, all the people who are saying, oh, it's witchcraft. Uh, oh, no, see, it's Christian. Oh, OK, it's Christian now. You know, it's if they can't co-opt it, they want to you know, oh, no. first they hate it. Then they try to co-opt it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, was everything in the, in the 80s they, they said Dion Warwick was satanic he <laughs> man and the masters of the universe was satanic. <laughs> everything was satanic because there was some element of something in there that had something to do with a power outside of Christ if it, if it represented a power outside of Christ bingo. that's devil worship that's it bingo and it's almost as if anything fun that's not Christian is bad and that's yeah yeah it's funny to see how that turns around, bites them on the ass sometimes. And like good evolutionary functions, they adapt and change and co-opt, you know. Too funny. Hey, while we're at a quick break, I should give a little plug out. We're talking about the nativity tonight. Uh, my friend Jonathan Pierce wrote a great book on the nativity and on the resurrection, a different book. But uh, all the breakdown of all the things that are wrong with the story and could not have happened uh the where the, it got influences from where you know in the in the old testament he does a fantastic breakdown of all those things so quick shout out to to him that's great yeah. that's great do we think we can uh entice him to come on our our little three-way chat here that would be I'll fun. Bet we could i'll bet we could uh richard carrier who also does amazing work on the nativity story in his book on the history of christ i'm sure we could get him on board too so stay okay. tuned for that well, I mean, I, you know, and I'll, I will say, hey, you know, um, you know, if you had uh, if you had to accept a gift from somebody at Christmas as an atheist, uh, you know, with the last five minutes here before we have to jump off, um, David, what, what what do you think is a, a good gift, uh, you know, for for you? For me, uh, books. I, yeah. I, there's always a book for me to read and a book that I want to have my eye on. And that's about all I buy with money anymore. I feel like I never see money. Food and books. You know, what else is there money for? So if it would be funny if I bought you the Ion book from Young? <laughs> you know, crazier <laughs> things have happened. Crazier things have happened. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. Do you, do you really buy books? Uh, have you, do you know Library Genesis has every book ever published for free download? You know, I have never quite warmed up to... to uh, Ebooks, I I, I want a real book that I can highlight. Or, oh, I see, I see. Okay, you nice. know, because um, that's my tool chest. You know, but but it, but I, I don't you think the copy, paste, and find is faster on a computer? You know, I I, I think I'm just kind of old school that in that particular way that um, yeah, it's I, I I appreciate all the arguments for it. I just have never quite warmed up to it. I wouldn't say it's wrong. I know there's I lots of people maybe, who love to read my books on ebooks. You know, could you say that it was like um, it, it binds to your learning apparatus? You know, I mean, like you, it's part of your research ritual. It is, and um, and there's something about being able to flip through it too, um, where I can just go, oh wait, where was that? Uh, oh, there it is. Boom. Um, that I find irresistible too. Challenge for you: How far away from your books are you, where you have a book with all of the uh, the notations and the shit hanging out of it. Is there one handy? Yeah, is there one handy like under a under a under a bookshelf? Uh, uh, it was well, gonna say I usually record in this room, which is actually our guest bedroom, because it's closest to the router. But mm -hmm. uh, I love your backdrop. Both of your backdrops of shelves. That would was what I would have if uh, if um, uh, if I could have my druthers, because there's usually a stack of books. Uh, currently, there's a, a, a book cart and there's three to four stacks wide of 10 to 12 books in each stack on each shelf of that book thing. And that's generally, the books change around, but it never seems to go any smaller than that. Um, I'm always got, I'm always juggling a lot of books. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And you know, the rich, you, you, you've got a, a retrieval mechanism for that shelf. Uh, you know, Scott is probably the same way. Um, you know, he's we've been in conversation and he twirls around and you know, <laughs> there it is. pulls up an introductory to Mark's, uh, you know, leaflet or something like that. And yeah. it's great to have it as, you know, as part of, you know, it's, it's great to have them on display. So I, I generally I have that. a good idea where things are, but the there are breakdowns when I 
bring too many books out to one spot and then I can't find the very book I'm looking for or remember if it's upstairs or downstairs. So that happens. But yeah, yeah. All right. Well, unless there's um, anything else that anybody wants to, uh, you know, wants to summarize about either the nativity scene or, or, or Christmas, the tradition of, uh, uh, of the holidays, um, I, I think we're going to be into the new year on our next I, recording. I, so, so. I, yeah. I have a Christmas. It's going to be good. I have a, let's see. I have a Christmas photograph I'd like to, oh, to share. Oh, yeah. This should be good. You, can you see this? Do you recognize what that is up okay. on there? Oh, I'll give I'm you a lightsaber if you can tell. Damn, I'm only seeing you and not seeing the photo. Is that visible? No, no. It gets cut off. Oh, because he's on his phone. I'm on my phone. Oh, oh here, 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 here we go. Here we go. What do we got here? Tell me if this looks, it looks at all familiar. Does anyone recognize what this is? Is that The Shining? Go closer. Hand no. signed. Hand signed by Nichols. By, uh, Nichols yeah, everybody. it's The yeah. Shining. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to share this. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Merry yeah. Christmas to everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas. And, yeah. and I hope I you guys have happy holidays, whichever holidays you, uh, you celebrate. Well, hopefully all of them and uh yeah we'll see you in the new year and i can't wait it'll okay, be great guys awesome all right thanks bye good night all bye bye the myth of jesus with david fitzgerald